Joining me now from Grand Rapids, Michigan, former Solicitor General for the State of Michigan and the Vice President of Appellate Advocacy with the Alliance for Defending Freedom, the attorney who argued this case before the Supreme Court representing Petitioner Harris, John Bursch. Tell well, us about your case. Good to be here. Uh, well, the, the case isn't as simple as Stevens and the ACLU makes it sound. Uh, Harris Funeral Homes is a family business in the Detroit area that has served the family members and the loved ones of the deceased for more than 100 years. And they have, as you can imagine, all kinds of policies, including a sex-specific dress code, to ensure that their clients are able to focus on processing their grief and not on the funeral home or its employees. So when the funeral home hired a funeral manager, a biological male, to, to interact with these clients, with the family members of the deceased, uh, that client or that uh, employee Stevens readily agreed to follow the sex specific dress code and did for nearly six years. Well, then Stevens came to the owner, Tom Ross, and said, after six years, I actually identify as a woman. I'm going to start dressing and presenting as a woman when meeting with these family members and friends. Well, Tom had to, to think long and hard about that. He, of course, was very concerned about the employee and the employee's wife. He was concerned about other female employees who'd be sharing the same restroom with this employee. And he was concerned about his clients. And in the end, he decided that was a plan that he could not go along with. Well, then the federal government and later the ACLU used that as an opportunity to redefine sex in federal law. And that's what this case is really about. Can you give us uh, a little bit of information about legislative intent and why it's so important in this case? Oh, it's critically important because if we don't have some way to measure the words of a statute or of the Constitution based at the time that they were enacted, we have chaos because any judge can say those words mean whatever they want. And so all nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court in the past have said that a statute could be uh, interpreted according to its original public meaning. So in this case, Title VII, the federal law that prohibits discrimination because of sex and employment, was enacted in 1964. So what we do is we ask what an American citizen, reasonably versed in the English language, would have thought sex meant in 1964 at the time the statute was enacted. And at the time, everyone understood it to mean biological sex, either a male or female, something that couldn't be changed. And if you want to have a different definition or have different definitions in different regions of the country, only Congress can change that. The courts don't have the ability to do that. And how would you respond to someone who might be watching this and say, you know, they're sympathetic and say, if a male to female transgender is transitioning, is it really that big of a deal? Why, why is the law in this case that significant? Well, there's a couple of huge reasons why it's significant. First and foremost, businesses and everyday Americans have to be able to rely on what the law says, not what on someone else thinks that it should mean. Uh, here, when we're talking about a law that prohibits discrimination because of sex, and has always been understood, even by the Supreme Court for more than 50 years, to prohibit treating women worse than men because of biological sex or vice versa, you can't just have courts making up new meanings for that. The only way you can do it through Congress. So then the natural question is, well, then why don't we just ask Congress to do that? And the reason is that when we have um, laws that prohibit things based on, say, ethnicity or race or sex, those are all immutable characteristics can't be changed. Everybody understands what those mean. When you're talking about things like sexual orientation or gender identity, which can mean a whole spectrum of things, Facebook used to have more than 70 different gender identities that you could choose from. Um, those are based on feeling. They're subject. They're based on social relations, constructs. Uh, they're not easily defined. And what we've seen across the country is that groups like the ACLU try to use laws like that to punish people who have religious beliefs that tell them reading the Bible, their relationship with God, and their, their strong convictions that God made men and women specifically for a reason, that that can't be changed. So are there are all kinds of problems in having judges just randomly change laws because someone thinks it might not be fair. So that brings up a good point, talking about uh, judicial advocacy. And I just want to point out that uh, President Trump has nominated and the Senate has confirmed about 193 Article Three judges. And there has been some talk on the left that he's trying to stack the bench and you know, trying to uh, make laws through judges. How does this case affect judicial advocacy and those judges that President Trump might be appointing, how it affects their ability to do that? Well, every judge who takes the oath to uphold the laws and the Constitution of the United States uh, should follow that construct that the Supreme Court has given them for interpreting statutes, Title VII. 
That is to look at the original public meaning. The problem is that in this country for far too long, judges have been willing to write their own policy of preferences into the law rather than simply just applying the law the way that it's written. I think that the vast majority of those judges that the current president has appointed are adherents to following the original public meaning of statutes. And let me give you a quick example why I think that approach is so important. Um, let's say that you were driving in a 55 mile per hour speed limit zone, and then you were pulled over because you were going 55 miles an hour. And you said, well, the speed limit said 55, I was going 55, why are you pulling me over? And the cop said, well, today I think that this actually means 45. Uh, even though anybody who passed the law would have understood it to be 55. Then all of a sudden, you're being subjected to criminal liability for something you could not have possibly anticipated. When right. judges impose their own policy preferences, they're doing the exact same thing. And so this case is going to determine whether the Supreme Court is going to continue to be a body that simply applies the law the way it's written or right. that imposes its own policy preferences on the nation. Great. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Want to see more videos like this? Click on the link below and subscribe to One America News on YouTube and call your cable provider and kindly demand that One America News is added to your lineup. Call and subscribe today.